Can someone tell me if you can see my slides? Yes, you, it's all good. Okay, so I'm going to start. People can just join in. So I'm Claire and I'm part of the Flexible Working Group. And I'm going to do a little introduction to our evening and then talk you through how it's all going to work and then do a brief intro to Category 1 training. So tonight's schedule is going to be short and sweet. We're recording it so you can tell your friends about it afterwards. I'm going to do a quick welcome. We're then going to run through different categories, category one, two and three, and then what each type is. We've then got some fabulous DMA reps coming along to talk about rostering and rights and how pay works. We've then got a really useful session with from the TPDs with some questions about updates. And then we've got 20 minutes of questions. So if you've got questions and put them in the chat so we can see them beforehand and we can plan the answers or ask them at the time. So this is the Flexible Working Group. We're about a year old. Uh, Margaret and I on the left are your outgoing chairs and Kate and Mega are going to be running the group as from now and Saeed as a TPD. And we've got a huge range of trainees in our group who all work flexibly on different categories and have lots and lots of knowledge about how to work flexibly. So why would you want to do part-time part training? How would you do it? What is it? Who pays for it? Very important. And what's category three? Category three is still quite new and is much more popular now than it used to be. So why would anyone want to train flexibly? I've been training flexibly for years and I think it gives you a wonderful work-life balance. You can spend time with your children. You can start new hobbies. You can spend your days off doing yoga. You can have second jobs. You can start your own business. It gives you flexibility to really make the life that you want. There's three categories of flexible working. Category one, the most well-known one, is for people that have children, so are caring for either adults or children or who are doing IVF. Category two is people who have amazing opportunities to run businesses, do really exciting sport, do some sort of something creative, for so something else, or, an, or a really amazing other course. And category three has been around for a couple of years now, and you can choose to work flexibly and to work less, just your own work-life balance, your mental health. So how do you work part-time and how do you apply for it? So the most important thing is to talk to your TPD really early. You need to plan this six months in advance to give them at least four months notice. Category two, three is recruited every six months. So you need to look in and I think the application opens is open now and closes really soon, which is why we're doing this now. You fill in a form which your TPD can give you or look on the London Deanery website or HEE, which has all the forms you need and how to fill them in. So there's two types of um, trainees that can work flexibly and have two ways the voter can work. You can slot share, which is when two trainees share the same slot. So you both work at least 50% and you tend to overlap days and you often do half the shifts each and you might do slightly more of the shifts. Or you can do job share where you share the job exactly and do half each. This is far less common these days. Most people will find they are slot sharing. You can work reduced hours in a full time post. Again, this is less common than it used to be. Often happens to trainees at 80%. You might work 80% of your rotor and the gaps are filled in by locums and other people, sometimes yourself if you happen to be slightly unlucky. So who pays? This is often a question, this is why the hospital will look at how they're going to roster you. If you are um, doing reduced sessions in a full time post, the hospital will get paid for your entire post from HEE. They will have to fund all the outer hours out of that, so we'll actually end up costing them some money. But if you are slot share, the hospital gets paid for both of your working percentages and they get a small 10% bump as a well done for helping their trainees work flexibly. So this is much more appealing to hospitals and their finances. We'll talk about category three in a bit when somebody talks about how, how it all works. The category three is often prioritised after category one and two because they're caring responsibilities. You can do anything 50% to 80% of your full time. You are guaranteed to get the days you want, so you have to try and be flexible around it. And you have to agree how you're going to work and how your working patterns are going to work with the hospital that you're working at. And always remember, obviously, if you work less, you get paid less. It's very sad. And we'll put resources on later. There's lots and lots of resources out there. We have an amazing flexible working page. If you go to the London Deanery website, you can find it. It's got lots of information on it, 
We've got a really good Trello board as well with lots of really useful Q's and A's, hot tips, how we can help you, that type of thing. So I'm going to run through category one quite quickly. This is the best known category. Most people, uh, when you think about working part time, most people think about people who have kids and work half the week. And this is a very classic way to work flexibly. So this is me. These are my two little beasts. They are now four and eight. And I have just started being a consultant, but I will worked flexibly for almost eight years of my career, so pretty much all my level two and my level three training. And I always work at the beginning of the week because that suited my lifestyle. So category one is people that have caring responsibilities for either children or adults with extra needs. Um, or if you're undergoing IVF or if you yourself ill. And once you've been granted permission to work as category one trainee, it's indefinite. You don't have to keep applying every year. You just carry on on the same training schedule. So I spend a lot of time, anyone knows me, talking about how amazing working flexibly is and how what a lovely work-life balance it gives you. If you've got children or something else you want to do, it gives you the chance to really have two separate lives, your amazing home life, your other work life, and your life at work. You can have a much more active role. You can be what the parent doing the school pickup, the parent taking the children to, um, to swimming, the person that looks after their own parents for two days a week. And if you are unwell, it gives that ability to work and then not push yourself too hard. There are cons to it, as there are to everything else. I've always found that the main problem for me is that it takes longer to settle into a job. If you're only there three days a week, it will often take me a few months to settle into a job. Whereas my full time trainees settle in much, much more quickly. You're, you're just there less, it's longer to feel part of the team sometimes. There's less continuity with your shifts. You often end up working two nights one week and two long days the next week. And it can be a bit here and there, and that is one of the bad things about working flexibly. Your training's longer, I'll come on to that in a minute, and obviously you take home less money. So if you think, this sounds amazing, how do I sign up? You think about what percentage do you want to work? What is going to work for your life? Why do you want to do it? And then you need to know what days you want to work. And then you need to know how flexible you can be. So if you know what days you want to work, are they set? Can you be flexible? How are you going to approach it? So as I said, if you work part time, it does extend your training by pro rata amount. So if you work at 50%, your training is going to be twice as long as it would have been. There's lots of rumours around that if you work at 80%, you can carry on at a full time pace. And obviously our training is competency based, not time based. But you have to be aware that technically you have to do the pro rata amount of training according to your um, work, full time work equivalent. And if you happen to have hit all your competencies and you're doing really well and your TPD is happy, you can get signed off early at a slightly lower percentage, but it's all negotiation. You have to be really proactive to make this happen. And it is not a given you can work 80% and just speed through at normal times. Obviously, the more you work, the quicker your training will be, as you can see. If you work at 80%, you only add on a couple of months to your normal year. But often because of the way the rotors work, you'll do one job for slightly longer or one job for a shorter time because our jobs are normally six months long. You can't train less than 50% and the maximum you can do is 90% or else it'll affect you to be full time. So people often say to me, which day should I work? What is the best day to work? And I think you think about what you want to do in your days off. What commitments do you want to do? What do your partners do? What do your family do? What works around your lifestyle? Most people who work flexibly under Category 1 will either work Monday to Wednesday or Wednesday to Friday, or slightly more than what percentage they're working. It's nice to work on a Monday because you're there at the beginning of the week. It's often nice to work on Thursday and Friday because the teaching is slightly quieter and you get to interact with people slightly more. There's pros and cons to both. Bank holidays and annual leave and pro rata. If you work at the end of the week, you actually get more bank holidays back because you'll be working you'll have more of them off. You work at the beginning of the week, you may have to repay some bank holidays effectively, so lose slightly more of your annual leave. And then obviously look at when your teaching is in your hospital. If teaching is on a Wednesday or this amazing clinic you want to go to on a Thursday, you may want to base your days around that. So I said the bank holidays are pro rata. If you don't work, if you're off on those days, you get them added onto your holiday allowance. If you work on a Monday and you've had all the bank holidays off, you may end up effectively owing bank holidays for having slightly less annual leave. Any rotation you go to, you're not guaranteed to have set days. No one is ever going to say you can always work Monday to Wednesday for your entire career. 
So you have to approach each job in a really proactive, flexible way. And I always say, think about what can you, how can you be flexible? What days can you offer? And what gift can you have to try and make your next row to work? If you're doing course in your non-working days, you can get toil back um, in return. And you can load them if you're working flexibly. You can put it on your ARCP form. And you'll find most flexible workers load them, especially in their own hospital, and filling gaps. Right, so I'm going to stop presenting and come back. Thank you very much for listening to that very quick gallop through. So we're now going to go on to Arash. Arash is there, who's going to talk about Category 2 trainees. Hi, can you hear me? Thanks, Arash. Great. Um, so I was asked to put some slides together and talk a bit about um, Category 2, which I will do. Um, I'm ST3. Um, I've been less than full time since uh, last September uh, and I've been 50 percent in that time uh, and um, will continue to be at that point uh, at least until next September. Um, I uh, ended up being category less than uh, category two less than full time because I um, had an opportunity to work in, in digital health in, in essentially health tech. Uh, that was something that I'd wanted to do in quite a long time. Uh, and the opportunity to do that has actually meant that it's uh, changed quite a lot of my career plans. Uh, I think it's complemented also my training as well. Um, so I was asked to talk about what I do in that time as a case study um, and then also talk about the benefits. So I'll, I'll talk about that in specifically about category two, because all of the things mentioned earlier do apply. But I think there are there is a little bit of a difference with between each of the categories and then also talk about some of the things that I wish I knew at the beginning uh, and uh, things that I found particularly helpful going ahead. Um, I'll put my email in there as well if there's any questions, but um, if there's time at the end, I'm happy to answer anything because it is a little bit different for category two. Um, so the first question that I kind of was asked to answer is what I do in my time. Um, so I work for a company called Humor, uh, which is Europe's fastest growing healthcare company. Um, and we've got kind of offices around the world. But my role is essentially running all of the pediatric work that we're doing um, around the world. So these are kind of the various different organizations kind of we work with um, uh, in life sciences, in research. We power quite big clinical trials. Um, we run healthcare deployments at kind of regional, sometimes national level. Um, and we do a lot of work with regulators to try and define how you regulate um, health tech in this space. Um, that wasn't what I started in the company. I just started off um, as a clinician providing some advice, but because I had the opportunity to work there for a year, I stepped up into this role. Um, and really, it's because of the, the less than full time status and actually um, being able to continue that less than full time status that the company offered me um, this new role going ahead. Um, and in terms of some of the stuff that kind of you can do in that, and this is, um, I find it quite useful to kind of compare it to the curriculum because a lot of people ask like tangibly, how do I think it's made my professional development improve, uh, better? So um, for example, on the leadership stuff, it, it's been a really cool opportunity to lead some projects at national level um, around the world and also at regional level. Um, I'm an academic trainee and for me the reason why I got involved in the first place was to develop the research skills and I've had the opportunity to work on a number of papers um, and actually now to build a research pipeline towards the PhD that I want to do as the result of my ACF. Um, lots of opportunities for QI, lots of opportunities for help promotion, also some opportunities for, for teaching. Um, Digital is like a really big priority area both for the college and the NHS uh, and there's a lot of appetite to try and think about how we train clinicians to get involved in digital health uh, to understand a bit better. At the moment there's no real pathway at all and everyone who I know who's done it, there's actually quite a few pediatricians who've left to set up their own companies or work for similar companies, um, have had to um, either go less than full time or in lots of cases actually leave training altogether. Um, I quite like the fact that I get to do a bit of both because I do find them quite synergistic. Um, but there's a, I think there's going to be a huge opportunity in this space going ahead because there's lots of organisations uh, both in the NHS and uh, around the world who are keen to work with clinicians in this space. Um, so in terms of why I found it really useful, um, and this is kind of stuff that I found personally, but also increasingly some of the feedback I've been getting at kind of from educational supervisors, ARCP, etc. Um, I do 
generally think that the opportunity to work less than full time to continue working less than full time is is making me a much um, better and, and rounded paediatrician. And I think um, as I progress through training and get closer to CCT, I do think it's given me some really valuable skills that I think will be um, quite useful as we think about more innovative ways of delivering care in the future. Um, I have gone out of programme before, and I think less than full time offers you a very different development opportunity. I think it can be a lot more synergistic. So if people are thinking about the difference between taking time out versus um, less than full time, um, I found uh, less than full time is much better if you're able to do something that doesn't need to be super immersive, but you can balance it with uh, you know, so that clinical time, um, but also something which you think you're going to continually use in your training rather than like a one off thing that you'll then take and apply to your NHS work. Um, I have found it really useful actually to map what I do towards the curriculum and that's where I think like the ePortfolio system um, despite its weaknesses actually can be really good because that's helped me uh, think about my professional development and also enabled me to do stuff in the NHS that I probably wouldn't have been able to do without this role. Things like um, so chairing governance meetings during COVID or helping writing business projects, particularly anything around digital, doing some QI work um, again around digital um, and mapping to the curriculum has been really useful. And I do actually think it's helped me understand the healthcare system a lot better because lots of the kind of the pain points that I used to just moan about with regards to like really bad IT, I now think I understand them a lot better. The thing I've loved the most though about the opportunity to go listen full time and to do something a little bit different is um, I'm now starting to work with um, to be honest, lots of consultants actually around London who are, are people who I've admired for a long time and actually had the opportunity to work with them as equals. So there's a few projects we're now starting to uh, look at in paediatrics where I've got the chance to work with um, people I've admired for, for years and years. And it's, it's actually really humbling to be in an opportunity to work with them in, in, part, in partnership. Um, and the final point is, is the research side. I've, I've, I'm an academic trainee. Um, I wasn't quite sure what kind of research I was really interested in, but in this role, I've actually found something that I both really like and, and actually want to base my career around and actually having the ability to work with those other teams um, in digital health, you know, um, software engineers, working with people who've got expertise in machine learning um, has really enabled me to understand that aspect of, of research and actually helped me think about what I want to do my PhD in. And, and part of the reason why I'm continuing in this role is um, I'm hoping to try and build a, a research pipeline to do that. So. Um, the kind of point that I want to make is that none of those things were op open to me at the opportunity uh, when I kind of started in that role. Um, but anyone who's vaguely interested in something uh, that they've always wanted to try, the thing I would say is, is give it a go. Um, and actually, you might be really surprised by how it can manifest because um, you tend to find that lots of the skills and attributes that you've used in your training can actually make you a really effective individual in, in, in other walks of life. Um, so that would be my thing to, to really go for it. Um, there are some downsides and uh, I'm going to mention some of them that I think are a bit more specific to category two. Um, all of the ones mentioned earlier do do apply. Um, I think it's really important uh, and I would completely echo Claire's point about planning your schedule ASAP. I found that personally there's been a win-win if I do that. Uh, you can create a schedule that works for the department quite nicely and works for you. Um, have those conversations early and I really encourage people to understand the rostering guidance and also the terms and conditions to, to know what is and isn't possible um, because you know that there are ways of having slightly more bespoke working arrangements or planning your working days around education opportunities both in hospital but also so, um, you know, the, the nature of your um, of your opportunity. Uh, category two sometimes means that by definition, you have to be working on certain days. So lots of people do it, for example, for masters and so on. So planning in advance is really important. Um, the whole point of category two is, is to use like a personal and professional development um, for yourself. So I think it's quite useful to track your achievements and map them to the curriculum. Um, that's both for yourself, because I found it's really helped me work out what I need from my training, but also what I need from that other opportunity and to complement them. But actually, I found everyone in the school, the TPDs, the heads of school educational supervisors, um, I've become actually really, really supportive once I was able to properly articulate what it was I was trying to achieve in that role and what I felt the benefits were. Um, I struggled to do that at the beginning, but after a few months in, I got a bit better at it. And actually, I've noticed everyone has been really, really supportive around it and, and you know, really trying their best to facilitate. And the final thing, and this is, I think, particularly important for Category 2, um, is just to remember that often you are still working full time. Um, Work-life balance is really, really actually quite difficult. Um, 
my digital health job, to be honest, it, it involves a lot longer hours than my clinical job. Um, it is important to try and think about setting boundaries because otherwise you're going to end up doing two jobs really badly. But on the flip side, Claire's completely right that, you know, it, it can be difficult to, to feel embedded part of the team. And I do feel you have to make a bit more of an effort to build relationships with your clinical team. Um, and that's something I didn't really appreciate right at the very beginning, but I made a much more of an effort to do uh, in, in kind of subsequent placements. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, I think I've run out of time, so I won't answer them now, but here's my email. Please that be, feel free to drop me a line, um, and I'm very happy to talk to anyone who's, who's got any questions about specific things or, or less than full-time more generally. I will now stop sharing. That was such an interesting talk. Thank you ever so much. We've probably got time for one really quick question. We've got two minutes, and if not, we'll move on. You put it in the chat if you don't want to say it. Um, with category two, one and two, is the flexibility to bunch shifts together? I'm just trying to read as I go. If you category one and two, is the flexibility to bunch shifts together? 80% is two months. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to hold that question for the TPD section at the end because they're much more expert about that than we are, but we hold that thought. I can, sorry, I can just come in. Can you hear me? I mean, I think, Neil, that would, it's Com Gomez, sorry. Um, I think that would really very much um, be a conversation that you have to have with your um, department that you're going to be working in. I think it would be quite difficult. It would be, it would very much be a rotor issue and something that you might need to negotiate with um, the other trainees who are on the rotor at the time and so on and so forth, because they'd obviously have to be willing to move their shifts as well. I don't think there's anything set in law it can't, that it can't happen, but it would very much be a negotiation, uh, I think. Thank you, Kim. Right, we'll move on. Thank you so much, Arash. That was a really, really interesting talk and lovely insight into the world of digital innovation. Um, can I quickly highlight that I made a mistake? I'm really sorry. You can't train more than 80% when you're training flexibly. That's a maximum percentage. So I've learned something as well tonight after eight years of flexible working. We're going to move on to Rachel, who's going to talk to us now about category three. Claire, can you see, have you got my slides or shall I try and share? You try and share, and if not, then I'll try and find them. Um. Can you see them? Something is happening. Yes, yes. you can. Thank you, Rachel. Let me see. So can you see my slides? I can't see them, but you can see them, can you? They disappeared. And now can you see it? Yes. OK, I can't see you, so I'm just going to talk and I'll tell you when the slides should be moving. Um, my name is Rachel Jones. I'm currently an ST6 in paediatric emergency medicine at St Mary's Hospital. And I've actually been a less than full time trainee since 2014. And I I like to think of myself as a bit of a pioneer of um, category three training, although obviously when I applied category three didn't exist. So I'm not going to talk so much about the technicalities of how to apply for, for um, category three training, but just a bit more about my personal journey. Can you see a change in slide? Uh, yes, yeah. I can. So hopefully you can see. So it's a little bit about my journey. So I was a trainee in Cardiff, um, having originally grown up in Hertfordshire near London. And in 2008, 2011, I had a really, basically a really fun time. I was um, enjoying having the financial independence of finally being a qualified doctor. Um, finally, apart from going to work each day and coming home, I, I just had so fewer jump hoops to jump through. Um, and as you can see, I spent a fair amount of time hiking, skiing, traveling, um, and actually did an F3 job in New Zealand working in A&E, both children's and adults, and essentially just really enjoyed a life that I hadn't been able to enjoy all the way through sixth form in university. 
Um, hopefully the next slide should come up soon. Um, 2011 to 2014 was a, a bit of a changing point for me. I came back to work in London. Um, not sure if pictures are coming up, but basically it was a time when life was starting to move on for myself and my friends. Training was getting serious. I'd, I had the run through job. I was doing my membership exams. Um, friends were starting to get married, having hen dues, and actually I, I ended up meeting a guy. It hadn't been my plan. I planned to come back and try training, and if it didn't work out, go back to New Zealand. But I met a guy and planned a wedding. Um, found it very challenging, um, juggling training with sorting out weekends, sort of NICU one in two weekends, trying to sort out time to um, spend time with my partner, time to make it to my friends' weddings, trying to negotiate my rota so that I could even get time off for my own wedding. Um, and the seeds sort of started to be sown in my mind of maybe paediatrics wasn't the right thing for me. Maybe I didn't want to work rotas at that point, one in two, one in three weekends. Um, you know, maybe I wanted to spend more time with my partner. I didn't want to have to say no to all of these social events that were coming up. And I started to become a little bit more unhappy and questioning what was the best plan. I'm going to tell the next part of my story, which I am denied about whether or not I should share, but um, I wonder whether it may ring true for some other people in the room. So in 2014, I began to think about, um, I was married, began to think about starting a family. Um, I actually ended up having two miscarriages, one of which was working on night shifts as an ST4 in a quite an acute DGH um, where there was only one registrar at the time on site um, and then actually had a second miscarriage a couple of months later. Um, at this point, as you can imagine, I was pretty miserable. I was also pretty exhausted um, and began to think about my life and what I could change and what I needed to change. Um, actually took on some careers coaching and started to think about whether I wanted to stay in paediatrics or not. Did I want to consider another career in medicine? Did I want to leave medicine? And actually um, came up that I, I did want to stay in paediatrics. I did want to be a paediatrician, um, but I also wanted to be a mum. I had a very supportive um, educational supervisor and although less than full-time category three didn't really exist then she essentially helped to support me to write a category two application that sort of essentially arguing for my mental health and, and arguing uh, to stay in to go less than full-time in order to preserve me in paediatrics the other thing for me was that I really wanted to lose some weight and I found myself totally unable to eat healthily exercise be a paediatric registrar, see my husband, commute to work, have a social life, be a daughter, be a sister. Like it just wasn't working for me. So I went to 60 percent, lost some weight and actually within a few months had got pregnant and had my first baby in 2016. I've been turning to my last slide now, but I've I've basically been um, a less than full time trainee since then. I won't dwell on this period because basically I'm now a category one less than full tra time trainee with two small children. Um, you can see, hopefully you can see my slides, you can see the current scene in my house. I've had to bribe them with a picnic in front of the TV in order to do this talk because my husband's actually not back from work yet. Um, and I've been almost every, in fact, I think I actually have been every single less than full time percentage that exists since then. I've put my email address at the bottom there because I know that particularly with things to do with fertility or baby loss or miscarriage, people might not really want to ask questions publicly. But I'm very happy if people want to email me and ask me more about my journey or, or share your experiences. Um, hopefully that's been insightful. Um, I think there's somebody else who's actually a current Category 3 trainee and hopefully they've got some other insights. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen. Thank you, Rachel. That was a lovely talk and thank you so much for sharing. I think it's really important to remember we're all human and we go through ups and downs and that's why flexible working is really important. It gives us the ability to lead, lead life we want to and life that we think we have to. We've got Anna next, so she's here. Rachel, if you can stop screen sharing. And I can't. Oh, Anna, I can see you there. Can you um, see me? Yes. Great. Um, so I've just been asked to talk quickly about why I decided to do less than full time category three training. I don't have anything like a PowerPoint presentation because it was um, I agreed rather last minute and I'm between night shifts. Um, but 
basically I just thought I'd quickly share what my thoughts about it were and why I decided to do it and then I'd give you all my email address if anyone's got any questions about it um so I'm actually no longer a category three um, less than full-time trainee although I plan on being one again I went back to full-time training just for these six months to do my neonatal um rotation so I'm currently an ST6 and I did category three less than full-time for the whole of my ST5 training period um I decided to do it because I had got to ST4 and I was going to take an UP and um, all of my plans fell through because of COVID. And I felt like I had got to the point where I um, felt that I was doing a lot of service delivery and not a lot for my future career prospects. And I really wanted to work abroad at some point in the, in the near future. And I felt that what I really needed to do was some courses in order to enable me to do that a bit better and to feel that I was doing something for my future career prospects as well as working um, in the NHS doing the job that I love which is paediatrics general paediatrics um, so I decided to apply for less than full-time training between uh, for the whole of ST5 going 80 percent and doing the global health and humanitarian medicine course with MSF and I think you, this is a course that you could do if you were training full time, it would be really, really full on, but you could actually complete it. But in my head, I just thought I'm, I need the time to do this properly and to really think about what I want to do with the rest of my career. Um, and what it did was it just enabled me um, some time to be really good when I was at work, really good when I was on my course. And as Rachel really pointed out, be able to see my friends, my family, have a social life and do the other things that I love doing in my life as well. Um, and I 100% don't regret it for a minute. I think that going to 80% particularly, which is the only full time percentage, uh, less than full time percentage that I've ever done, was um, a really good balance because I didn't feel like I didn't see less of the clinical scenarios. I felt like I was still getting the training I needed. Um, and I was able to do other things on the side. And I also felt like it made me better when I was at work and it made me concentrate better when I was at work because I was less exhausted um, and more sort of switched on and interested. So that's my less than full time training story. Um, it's a short one, but I plan on going back to it in September, uh, March next year. <laughs> Um, and if anyone has any further questions, I will send, I'll put my email address in the chat. Um, and particularly if you want to know about that Global Health and Humanitarian Medicine course, because that was a really, really fantastic um, and very different thing to do. And I think has made me better at my job overall. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for whizzing in at the last minute to give us another perspective. We really appreciate it. And your part of your working family. So we're now going to move on to Maddie and Emma, who are BMA reps. And thank you so much for both coming here and having a talk to us. They're going to talk about rostering rights and pay. Again, please put any questions you have in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just introduce myself whilst um, Maddie's getting the slides together and hopefully she'll be able to share her screen. Um, my name is Dr Emma Coombe. I'm a paediatric ST7 in the Severn region. I'm currently a category two less than full-time trainee and I do that for my uh, BMA work and uh, work with the Royal College. Um, some of you will also know I sit in the RCPCH trainees committee and I'm currently the national rep for recruitment to the PEDS training scheme um, and I currently work less than full-time at 90% in Bristol Children's Hospital. Uh, uh, Maddie, do you want to say hello? Hi, I'm Maddie Peds ST5 in East Yorkshire and uh, kept one LTFT trainee. I've been an LTFT trainee all the way up from the start of foundation because uh, I was stupid enough to have a baby at med school, uh, which is not recommended. I'm trying to work out how to share my screen. Uh, I don't think I have the option to as a guest. Do you want to email me the presentation and then I can um, share it quickly? In the top right hand corner of your screen, you probably see an, an arrow in a an upwards arrow in a box. Next to the leave button, not sure if you've got that. Oh yeah, I, the, it says open share tray, yes. Uh, does that work? 
Yeah, it's coming up now. Hey, so, um, you, you can the, see it? Yeah. yeah okay, see. brilliant. Go so the reason we've both been um, asked to speak to you this evening is that we currently chair the um, less than full time forum of the junior doctors committee at the BMA. So um, we're just new in that post um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, Maddie, however, has done the role before um, and is very experienced with all things less than full time. Um, and we're just going to talk you through some of the practicalities, the logistics, your your working rights um, as a less than full time doctor. Um, Maddie, can you scoot on through the next couple of slides for me? if you're controlling fab so you've already looked at the um the different types of of category one two um and three working um you can be uh, less than full time in a slot share you can be supernumerary in your post or you can work less than full time in a full-time post and sometimes those um uh, nuances of your um uh, allocation to a specific trust in your region can have impacts on the the ways in which you can work um and the hours and the flexibility there so it's useful to have a chat with your tpds and and those that are doing your rotations and um, to know what sort of a post that you're in uh next slide please maddie so let's look at rostering. Um, we have got this um, really comprehensive guide um, at the BMA called the Good Rostering Guidance that um, was co-written with BMA and NHS employers who um, sit above, um, you know, trust management. Um, and it's got loads of really helpful hints and tips in there. Some aspects of this guidance have been superseded by the 2016 contract. So you'll um, know that the, the contract was renegotiated um, following the industrial action in 2016 and there have been several iterations of the contract um, since then now that we've come to an agreed um, contract and that that dispute has been resolved we've been able to continue tweaking um, the contract in ways that are beneficial for both employers and trainees so it's always worth checking both the good rostering guidance and the 2016 contract because we're on version 9 now um, and you can find the the full glory of the contract online um, for all of the specifics about your your rights at work um, but these are the, the basic points. Uh, any less than full time rotor, you should um, count the number of shift types um, in a full time uh, work schedule and pro rata it down accordingly so that you as a less than full time trainee are doing the same proportion of in hours work versus out of hours work so that your training experience is not compromised um, and that you're you're equally participating in, in um, you know, covering the out of hours burden. Next slide, please. Maddie. So um, in a slot share, the out of hours are usually split 50% down the middle um, uh, and the rest of your hours um, are made up to match your working percentage um, unless the doctor agrees otherwise. If you're less than full time in a full time slot, then you're less than full time. It, your out of hours should match your in hours percentage um, and that should be inclusive of any leave deductions, adjustments for um, safe working controls like zero days. Um, so that you shouldn't be as a less than full time trainee left with all of the gaps left available on a rotor. Your rotor should still have some semblance of a pattern with similarities to the, the full time schedule unless you agree otherwise. And I know there was somebody asking a question earlier about exactly what's possible um, and the person answering is exactly right. It's all down to local negotiation um, and there's no reason why you can't negotiate an alternative arrangement if it's in the benefit of your employer and you. Thanks, Maddie. Um, so, yeah, we've sort of talked about that. Dif different working um, environments can sometimes lend themselves to different working patterns. Uh, this is more difficult in paediatrics where we've got, you know, things like um, uh, acute hour hours cover. But if you're a community peds trainee, for example, there's no reason contractually why you couldn't negotiate term time only working um, if that's what worked for you. Um, so, the, the the contract and the good rostering guidance means that um, you have a right to sit down and try and negotiate um, what's best for me from a, a training perspective. Thanks, Maddie. And um, the guidance also states that all reasonable requests uh, or all reasonable attempts should be made to facilitate uh, set working day patterns. Um, and I think uh, 
it, now that we've got that as a contractual right, that gives even more protection to um, trainees, particularly those who have got caring responsibilities or commitments in, under category two, like a master's or something where you need a fixed day pattern. You not now have that as a contractual right for your employer to make all reasonable uh, attempts to, to facilitate that. Um, and, and unless you agree, no shift should then be rostered on your non-working day in a fixed pattern. Now, one thing to know about that is you don't always have a right to pick specifically which days. So, for example, if you're put in a slot share with another trainee who usually has Monday to Wednesday as their working days and you also want those working days, you're going to have to negotiate with that person that you've been put into a slot share with because although you've got a right to fixed working days, you don't have a right necessarily those to those specific fixed working days, if that makes sense. Thanks, Maddie. The other thing to be aware of is um, the rostering deadlines, um, which when you've got other priorities in your life um, that necessitate or mean you want to work less than full time can be even more important. So it's really uh, important that you are aware of what you're entitled to with regards to these um, deadlines. So you should always get 12 weeks notice of um, which trust you'll be working in. Um, that's dependent on um, uh, data from HEE. Um, so that can be a little bit tricky because Health Education England are, are not our employer. So you don't have quite so many rights there. But you should get um, uh, eight weeks notice of your generic work schedule and six weeks notice of your personalised uh, work schedule and your individual rota from your employer and now in the latest version of the contract um, these are contractual they're not guidance so any employer that's not providing you with this amount of notice um, is in breach of your contract with them um, so you should all be aware of exception reporting as a mechanism for logging where you're um, sometimes having to work late or miss your breaks or miss teaching etc and um, also use it for when you're getting late notice of your um, uh, rosters um, so that your trust is aware and can act on that information Information. And then within four weeks um, of starting new in a post, ideally as soon as possible, sometimes even before, sit down with your supervisor to personalise your work schedule. So that's about um, looking at the educational opportunities available in your post, thinking about your specific PDP um, and personalising it to you to make sure that you've got those um, things written into your work schedule for the rest of the post. Thanks, Maddie. I think I might be handing over to... Oh, no, I'm going to talk a little bit about pay next. OK, so um, do, you want, let's do, you, do you want me to do this bit? Or do you want yeah, to go on. on. I've been talking enough, haven't I? <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, crack on. You, you look like the end was in sight and then it was snatched away from you. So entirely up to you. Do you want to continue or shall I? No, go on. You do pay. <laughs> Hello. Right. So let's do. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm in my daughter's room and that's a Doctor Who alarm going off. Oh, I've just uh, lost control. There we go. OK, so um, there is absolutely no way of taking you through the entire complicated structure of your pay in the next five minutes. So what I am going to do is I am going to um, just give you a few pointers for the sort of things that you should expect to see on your pay slip, where you should go to get more information and what sort of things go wrong. So. If you are, um, so if you were ST3 or above um, in August 2016 before changeover, then you will you will continue to progress along the um, old pay scales, which was basic and banding with a yearly increment. Um, if you were more junior than that, you will be on the new contract pay scales if you're in England. Is everybody here London? You're all England. OK, you can always submit questions if you are from somewhere else, because it's different in some of the devolved nations. Um, so th there are these two. I think may start. Grand. Oh, if there's if there's a problem, they can always find us and ask us questions. Um, so in the past, there, you had your you had your basic pay and then there was a, a supplement that was 20 percent, 40 percent or 50 percent of that salary on top to cover your out of hours work. Um, and there is a calculator online for um, putting your rotor in and finding out actually what you should be getting um, on the on the new pay scales. And it's it, it's really important to note, and not everybody knows this, that that pretty much e e that everybody is now on the new contract. Everyone's on the new contract in England, 
but some people are on the old pay scale and some people are on the new pay scale. Um, if you are on the, the new pay scale, there are loads of different bits that make up your pay. And all of these bits that make up your pay will show up on your pay slip and they will show up in your work schedule. The work schedule is that document that you get that tells you what your hours are going to be, what you're going to be doing in the post educationally, um, and also what your pay and what your leave are expected to be. So it's very, very important when you get your, um, th that you know how to check all of these things. So here we have all of the different bits that make up your salary. So your basic pay, which is what you get at your, grade so no longer years of training as it used to be but at your grade so f1 f2 st1 to 3 st3 to 5 st6 and above are the different points um and you get a you get uh, your number of hours of that then you get um, an allowance for the frequency of your weekends and please note that this is frequency of you, of of how many um how many weekends you work rather than how many days of weekends you work. Um, the on-call bit it refers to people... Hello? The on-call bit refers to uh, non-resident on-call. So we say we're on-call when we do a long day or a night, but we're not, we're on shift work. On-call refers to people who are at home available to be called in. So this is just for people who are non-resident, um, these next two bits. The flexible pay premium doesn't apply to paediatrics, so that's for um, things like emergency medicine and general practice. Um, and if you if you live in, in London, you get some extra money because it's very expensive down there, they tell me. Um, and an allowance for working LTFT because everything is really expensive when you're LTFT and you end up paying more than your share of things like uh, college fees and GMC fees and all that business during your, your training. So that's an attempt to make that a little bit um, fairer. So, um, so first of all, for your, for, for your basic salary, the, if you are full time, the salary that you should get is calculated for 40 hours a week and then the full timers get extra hours on top of that. So um, they if they work 44 hours, they get an extra hours bit of, of four hours. We don't get that, but our basic salary is calculated according to the number of hours that we work exactly in a week in our placement. And these the nodal points refers to your grades. So you guys, if your peds will be on one of these nodal points here. So your basic pay will be a proportion of one of these, depending on how many hours you do a week, not what percentage you are, but how many hours you do a week. Um, weekends. So um, it's very important to know that your weekend pay is based on the frequency of weekends and when you're less than full time it's based on your frequency compared to the full timers so not the frequency you work but the frequency you work compared to the full time people so if the full timers work one in three weekends and you're a 50 percent trainee and you um, decide to work full weekends but half as often as them you work one in six weekends which means you work half the weekends that they work so you get half the the weekend allowance that they get all of this av is available online and I'll tell you where to find it if you are a 50% trainee and you decide to split your weekends so that so for example you have fatigue issues and you can't work the full weekend or caring responsibilities or whatever so you split all your weekends and you end up working one in six weekends but you're only doing the Saturday you are still working one in three weekends like them so they're doing one in three weekends you're doing half of it um, but you're doing half of it by doing half of every weekend they do rather than half the number of weekends this means that you're working the same frequency as them you are working one in three you get the same amount of weekend pay for you the exception to this is Friday nights at the moment. So Friday nights into Saturday doesn't count as um, as a weekend for the purpose of calculating weekend frequency in pay, but it does count as part of a weekend um, when you're calculating uh, how many weekends you are allowed to do. This is an anomaly. We're working on it. When you're less than full time, um, there are the the, the there were there are 
things that have been done to try and protect your pay. So if you are still on the old pay scales, which means you are going up every year rather than every grade because you were quite senior in 2016, um, then you continue incrementing until you get to the top pay point and then you sort of sit there. And that's called cash flow pay protection. Um, and that is due to expire in August next year. And we are aware this is a bit of a big deadline. And we've got our eye on that and seeing what we can do. If you are... Um, I'm talking nonsense. That isn't cash flow. Forget me. That continues until 2025 and then is being reviewed. So don't worry about that. You've got a few years left. So if you were quite senior and you um, you are you are continuing to progress along that pay scale going up year after year without you without your grade being involved, then that continues until 2025. And then there's a review of that part of the contract. If you are um, LTFT and you are on the new pay scales. So you are being paid with this um, nodal point salary and then all those little add-ons for the weekend, your out of hours pay, so you get extra pay for nights. All hours of night shifts are time plus 37% um, and, and, and your London waiting and all of that stuff. Uh, you get a £1,000 a year LTFT premium just for being LTFT in recognition of the fact that everything's more expensive when you're LTFT. And um, if you were already LTFT in August 2016, you get 1,500 until next year, which point drops down to the 1,000. So it's quite common for trusts to miss this out. So if you're LTFT and you are on the new pay scales, you should be getting this. Whatever reason you're LTFT, whatever percentage you are LTFT, you should be getting this. So check your pay slips. Yeah, there it is. And this is the flexible pay, pay premium. So this isn't you guys. So this is um, there are certain there are certain training programs where either they need a pay premium to keep their pay competitive or they are a hard to fill program um, where we're trying to attract people to that. Or it's academics who've had to step out of their training program but, uh, and bring um, bring added value when they come back, have uh, extra cash to recognize the things that they are doing. So academic peds people might get some of this but the rest of peds won't um so in terms of pay and i will spend a little bit longer on this because these are the things that, that you that i really think you need to know so um as less and full-time trainees it is really 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 common for your employers to get your pay wrong um and if they underpay you you can go without and if they overpay you they can make you pay it back if, they just, if they've made an overpayment, you have to pay it back. They have to give you time to pay it back over. Um, so they can't demand it all back at once. Even though they try, they can't do that. They have to give you time. But you don't want that to happen. You don't want to be underpaid and you don't want to be overpaid. It's really important for you to understand your pay and to be really disciplined about knowing how to read your pay and your work schedule and checking that everything matches up when you get it so when you come into a new job what you need to do is you need to make sure you have got that work schedule you've got a copy of a full-time rotor or work schedule so that you can compare your weekend frequency to theirs and, and you've got your rotor and you check the rotor and you check the work schedule and you make sure that all of the hours match up that there's no mistakes there um, and you check that um, you check your pay slip and you make sure that all of the bits that you expect to be on there are on there and what I do is I will add up all my shifts I will count up all my hours myself um, I will make sure that everything on that pay slip is correct and that I know how to do it um, and once you've done it the first couple of times it takes only about an hour every six months and it's well worth doing because if there's a problem nip it in the bud early they often uh, things often go wrong they often leave out the LTFT premium they will often get the weekend frequency calculation wrong so they'll say oh you're 60 percent so you get 60 percent of the weekend premium and um, they will often get your your hours wrong so they will so they will say you're 60 percent therefore you work 24 hours and they'll pay you based on 24 hours rather than the 28 that you actually work um or they'll just use a generic rotor in your work schedule rather than your own so these are things that you need to be wise to look out for and another really really common problem that i've had two queries about this evening is there's a little bit on your pay slip which is leave adjustment and this is a fairly complex problem but in in a nutshell at, uh, at some point on your work schedule you will find something that says average hours and then another little box that says average hours after leave adjustment that second 
number should always be higher than the first. So this is because they have to calculate what your total hours are after they've knocked your annual leave out, because on your annual leave, um, your annual leave is taken on normal days, so you work less in those weeks. So to pay you fairly for the weeks you're at work, they have to pay you with discounting the annual leave. But the software has a really, really nasty tendency of assuming you're full time for the purposes of this. Um, and the way that this manifests is that they'll calculate your hours and they'll say your average hours are 28 a week, but after leave adjustment, they're 26 hours per week. And then they will pay you as if you are working 26 hours per, per week. This is incorrect. So always check that bit. And if your average hours go down after adjustment for leave, it's really important that you um, challenge that. OK, um, Emma, do you want to do study leave and teaching? Because I've now done lots of lots of talking. Yeah, sure. Let's just whiz through this. So uh, next slide, please. Basically, um, you're entitled to go to the, the same proportion of um, uh, study leave as um, uh, your working percentage. Um, so your 30 days, you just get pro rostered down. Um, next slide, please. If you attend something that's mandatory for your progression on a non working day or something that's non mandatory, but something that you have agreed with your educational supervisor, put in your PDP so, uh, study leave for, um, then uh, you are entitled to um, take a day back off in lieu elsewhere or for the additional pay. Next slide, please. So that's now enshrined in the contract. So make sure that you're not being asked to do work and not being paid for it just because you're working less than full time, because that's clearly wrong. If you're taking maternity adoption, shared parental leave, um, your entitlement to study leave continues and you can take that on keeping in touch days um, uh, if uh, it's part of your uh, phase return back to work. Next slide, Maddie. We're running out of time, so I'm just going to quickly whiz through the next bit. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about work schedule, haven't we? Um, and for less than full time, the definition is that you're working 40 hours per week or less. Um, and we've talked about the deadlines already. Next slide, please, Maddie. Um, you're entitled to a bespoke work schedule and um, uh, as a less than full time trainee, and that's because it's as for some of the reasons Maddie, Maddie has alluded to, your pay will almost certainly be wrong unless they put your specific pattern into the software that calculates whether the rotor is safe uh, from a working hours point of view. And that's the same software that calculates your pay. So you need to always make sure that your work schedule matches up exactly with the rotor that you're going to be working, because otherwise you're not going to be getting paid correctly. The one um, caveat to that I would say is there are some departments who are trialling self-rostering for junior doctors and that can be a tricky situation because the rotor isn't known about for the whole placement at, at the, the start of the placement if you're self-rostering often um, and in that case what we would recommend is putting in a roster that's an indicative roster as close as possible to the pattern you're likely to be working same number of nights and weekends because of, often when you're self-rostering uh, you're asked to fulfill a um, particular component of nights and weekends anyway, and um, so you're all doing your fair share um, to, to make sure your pay is as accurate as possible. All right, next slide, please, Maddie. Uh, so that's what your work schedule will look like. Um, and yeah, Maddie's talked about your uh, um, leave adjustment there to make sure that calculation is correct. Uh, so uh, Layla's asked, do the BMA offer a service that checks uh, pay slips? Um, so there is a there is a um, a checking tool where you can check your rota for the purposes of safety. Um, if you've got questions about whether you're being paid correctly, then I would always just ring the BMA. Um, so the employment advice line is open to members until 8 p.m. on weekends and 5 p.m. on Saturdays. There's also a live web chat where you can get through to somebody almost instantly and you can email. And on the live web chat, you can send them screenshots of your um, uh, pay slips um, and your work schedule. And it's just a really uh, easy uh, way to um, get rapid advice. Next slide, please, Maddie. We've talked about all of that, I think. Yeah, next slide again. Um, and then another part of the um, 2016 contract is that all trusts should now have a champ champion of flexible training. Next slide, please, Maddie. Um, so uh, their, their whole 
reason for being is to promote and improve ex- uh, existing support for less than full time trainees, because we know as less than full time trainees, it's really common for your employers to get things wrong with your rostering, with your pay. And sometimes it can feel like a real battle just to get the basic things that you're entitled to. As more and more people become less than full time and with the expansion of category three training into peds and now lots of other specialties, I really hope that this will change because I think people are waking up to the fact that working a 48 hour working week on average for decades of your life isn't particularly attractive and um, I think it was Rachel uh, hearing your story about you know the the way um, the reasons for you working um, you know pursuing category three less than full-time training and and 80 percent is just a normal person's any other normal non-medical person's job isn't it a, a 37 week it, it shouldn't need to be anything special um so uh, that's why maddie and i do what we do to um try and advocate for um less than full-time trainees at a, a national level but you've got this person in every trust um and they work closely with your guardian of safe working sometimes they're even the, the same person okay have we got any more slides maddie i think we might just have one on how you can represent less than full-time doctors if you're interested in um uh, progressing uh, the lot of less than full-time trainees where you work. Every trust in England has a local negotiating committee and that's made up of BMA reps of all grades, so junior doctors, SAS doctors, um, consultants, um, and that's supported by BMA members of staff and you sit down together um, every quarter, every couple of months um, with uh, your trust leadership um, and talk about issues that are affecting doctors where you're working. Um, And uh, that's a really important place to have less than full-time representation. As well as that at a regional level, every region of the uh, of the UK has a regional junior doctors committee. So um, just Google find your RJDC um, and you'll find your regional committee and um, every one of those committees should have a less than full time rep. Um, and it's possible for to have more than one. These work really well as a job share um, and um, uh, you can collaborate uh, across trusts um, in your region um, to tackle issues that are affecting multiple workplaces. Um, and uh, we hold a specific less than full time conference for um, uh, BMA members. Um, and that is happening in February. So have a look out. I don't think registration is open yet, but I think it's going to be Maddie the 10th of February. 10th our last February. Time. Yeah. Save the date save the date for our lesson full-time conference so basically we'll just do all of what we've talked about here but massively expanded and some workshops so that you can ask more questions um okay i think we'll leave it there because we're out of time but we're sticking around for the q a um thank um, you for i um i told you guys so just just before we finish sorry it's been it's been mm. an awful lot of talking and i'm sorry about that emma's done an absolutely fantastic job it is so hard to get through this stuff in such a short time and it can be super super overwhelming um but I will provide my email address to the organisers. This is probably the best way of doing it. And um, you can email them and ask, and I will send you a link with the information on where I go to find this stuff. So I will I will put a bunch of links in it for you um, to the places where, which will help you learn to calculate your pay. Okay, so I'll provide my email address. You can get it off the organisers and I'm very happy to be contacted and send that information sheet out to you. Maddie and Emma, thank you so much. That was an amazing gallop through all those questions. I really appreciate you doing the talk and for staying on for the Q's and A's. We've got a quick talk from Anna Pute next, who, if I've got the correct title, is a consultant in neonatologist. She's also deputy head of school and she's TPD for GRID. So thank you very much, Anne. Over to you. Hiya, um, I'm sorry, I am multitasking. I have just rushed in and I'm trying to make dinner. Um, I had hoped that I would be in a bit earlier, but um, uh, I'm covering ITU as well and we've had um, a sort of crisis situation, the usual. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I don't have any slides, so I really just, uh, I have some of my program uh, management TPDs on the call, I think, with me, um, Kum and Shanti. Um, so feel free to... Um, to um, bot in when I miss anything. Um, I wasn't sure what my remit will be. Um, So I would just tell you a little bit about program management um, relating to less than full-time trainees. Uh, So I oversee the the grid um, and uh, Shanti and Atifa are the um, level three program management CPDs and Kum uh, is for level two in the south and for level Two in the north, we have Sunita and uh, Ruth uh, Shepherd is is for um, 
the South level uh, one and Olu Wilkie and Khadija are for the North level one. And Ruth also kind of oversees the less than full time approval. So um, she's deputy head of school and, and that's, that's also part of her remit. So um, I think what, what I would like to say, first of all, with program management um, for trainees who are um, wanting to or are training less than full time is that you all trainees should have a good relationship with their program TPD. But I think it's essential for less than full time trainees so that we ensure that we are um, meeting your training needs and ensuring that um, we can get good continuity for your program. Um, now, I'm, I don't know if, if this was said earlier on, but uh, every trainee has an indicative CCT date when they start the program. And that is an indicative CCT date that is set based on the time. Um, and it's indicative in that that's all it, indi that's all it does. It indicates, it's, it's, I was saying to Said earlier on today that, you know, training is like embarking on a long distance journey or a long distance race. And you've got a target at the end, which is CCT. Um, but how you get there and, and how long it takes for you to, to get there is, is variable depending on lots of factors. So obviously le training less than full time is one of them. And, um, you know, we will have to look at placing trainees less than full time, ideally in short slot shares. That is the preferred um, GMC Gold Guide recommendation and HEE recommendation. And so um, ideally we will place less than full-time trainees in slot shares. And so it's important that we know as soon as we can, as soon as that trainee either moves into that level or comes into the program, that they are um, wanting to train less than full-time. At the moment, the way the application process goes, it's it's not always clear. And the program TPDs don't always get notification from, um, you know, the trainee has put it through, uh, applications through the portal and it's gone in. Um, and it might have been sent to Ruth Shepherd to to say this trainee wants to train less than full time, uh, but the program TPD has kind of been left out of the out of the equation, and that's really important. So I would ask that all trainees, please, you can find uh, the details of your program management TPD, and you should email him, uh, email her, because we're all females at the moment, but email her and and let them know uh, because your um, placements will have to change obviously and you would have to be put into slot shares. The, the, the usual um, uh, program management guidelines um, or guidance will apply. We try and keep you in the same trust for as long as possible in the same um, so that you know the same location so that we um, we don't move you around as longevity so you can have the, your, the same ES for as long as possible. Um, but obviously, sometimes if you're going less than full time, we may need to move you uh, to, to be able to make um, best use of slot shares. Now, I want to talk a little bit about slot shares, if I, if I may. Um, one of my, my um, less than full time, um, uh, what do you call her now? Not a guardian, but she's just kind of the, um, what was the word you used earlier? Just as you finished your presentation, she's kind of like the promoter of, of less than full time trainees yeah. in our trust. Yeah. And she says that, you know, she doesn't like the word um, job sharing because she says that, you know, you're not. But it, in a way you are, um, you have your own individual training needs. But when it comes to um, the rotors, then you are slot sharing and you are actually job sharing in terms of that of that rotor. So the long days and the nights and all of that. Um, and that, that's quite important to manage because the out of hours aspect of the post is not in is not within the jurisdiction of the school or, or, or the training of or HEE. It's actually with the employing trust. And what that means then is that um, if you're 60 percent, for instance, and you've got a slot share working at 60 percent, then both of you will be allocated 50% um, out of hours. Most times, um, we have no control, even if we say you're working 80% to tell the trust to up your out of hours to 80%. Is that a problem? Not always, but for some trainees, it can be. Um, one problem is that obviously you, your take home pay will be less. Um, because you're 50% of, of the out of hours rather than 80% when it comes to calculating your pay. Um, but the, also, the other issue is also um, 
that your training opportunities, whilst it's not under the jurisdiction of the school, may be curtailed, particularly in some craft subspecialties like neonates and if you're um, a subspecialty level three trainee, potentially. So it's just something to think about and consider really. Um, it, it's kind of, I don't think it's insurmountable because there are lots of gaps in rotors elsewhere and you might be able to get the, the, the time and the experience. But it means it's just one more thing that needs to be considered when you are, um, uh, you know, embarking on less than full time trainees, particularly as you're going up the training ladder. The other issue, I think, when it comes to program management is that trainees want to know, less than full time trainees want to know who their slot share partners are. And ideally, we would love to let you know as soon as we put place you with a slot sharer. But um, we've got that uh, horrible um, GDPR guideline that tells us that we can't just give out information. And what we're trying to do is to actually get a kind of um, uh, um, a form that maybe less than full time trainees can fill in that says, I don't mind right from the beginning, right from the time when you say I want to be a, a, a less than full time trainee, that I'm happy to share my details with any potential slot sharer so that you know and you can start to plan. Um, and we do try where possible if we know that there's a trainee that uh, we can see two trainees who are less than full time and seem to have the same training trajectory and aims. We do try to kind of place you together um, and we we kind of high five each other when we've got we've got it, you know, for a year, two years, you know, they move the trusts together, that kind of thing. But of course, um, one trainee might go out a program, one trainee might um, decide to accelerate their training or change their training trajectory. So it's not always possible um, to, to, to do that. Um, what else? Uh, I also want to talk about category three. You probably have mentioned that. Um, category three at the moment is under, it's different from the other categories in that it only opens at certain times of the year. And I think we've just opened the current um, window. I think there are about 27 trainees or something like that that have applied for this. Um, but the other thing to say is that you don't have to, if you've been given category three in the past, you don't need to reapply. And um, HEE, the, they wanted to sort of make sure that I let you guys know that because I think people think that they need to reapply you don't so if you've been given category three and you want to continue to train less than full-time then it's a one-off um, approval and we will keep you as less than full-time on the program unless you tell us that you want to move to full-time or you want to change your hours uh you can tell I'm quite rattled. I hope I've gone through what I wanted to go through. The other thing I just want to briefly talk about is stepping up to full time if you want to. Recently, I've had a few um, requests from trainees, to, less than full time trainees to step up to full time. And unfortunately, for some of them, we have not been able to um, uh, place them in full time posts. So it's just worth thinking about that it's you may not necessarily be able to step up to full time when you want to, but like everything else, the sooner that you can discuss with your TPD, um, the sooner we might be able to get you into a, a, a full time post. It may mean moving trusts um, because if you have a slot sharer, then clearly you cannot step into a full time post because. Um, we have no supernumerary funding and um, uh, yeah, so that would be difficult. Um, yeah, I think, Shanti, have I missed anything, Kum? No, I think uh, that's been pretty comprehensive. I think uh, the bullet points about the out of hours that you covered was that actually that's outside the remit of the school and it is very much locally negotiated. So whilst you um, in a slot share might split, there is an expectation that uh, from a trust that you might want, they might try and organise with gaps that you actually do do your percentage out of hours that you do a pro rata, but it's a local arrangement. So um, I would say please have conversations early um, with your local rotor coordinator because that is outside of the London School of Paediatrics remit. Um, and I don't know whether right at the beginning, Claire, you covered the um, notice periods of when when you apply, what notice you need to give? Um, I said about four months or 16 weeks, ideally. Except yeah. category three. 
Thank you so much, Anne. That was really comprehensive and very impressive. I've a bit busy day on ITU. We're going to move on to the Q's and A section. I want to just quickly thank all the TPDs, Kim, Shanti, Anne and Saeed for coming along and giving up the evening to help us. To Emma and Maddie for giving up again your evening to help educate us. And a huge shout out to Marietta, who's been behind the scenes very quietly, who's been heading up the part time agenda for a long time as part of the trainees committee and is now moving on to the consultant life. But it's been really instrumental in moving on this group and helping promote flexible working. So we've got about 20 minutes of questions or less if we've got fewer questions. Just put the questions in the chat or put your hand up and we'll come to you or shout out. Tell us anything you have and we can we have lots of expertise to help answer it. Claire, I can't see the chat, so you're going to have to um, shout them out. We'll direct it to you if a TPD question comes out. So whilst people are um, typing uh, into the chat, or please put your hand up, um, we have collated um, some questions uh, from people who can't be here, as uh, there were about uh, almost uh, 80, 90 registrations, and there are about 30 people on uh, the call. So I'm just going to read out a couple of questions, um, and I let, uh, I don't know, Kate, whether you um, see the chat. If you can't, I can keep coming back to the chat. Um, as such, but the questions were. Um, so I think we have probably answered quite a lot of questions about uh, flexibility of working patterns uh, during less than full time training. Uh, but um, there was a, a particular question uh, from one of the trainees um, how exactly does less than full time training work? I'm currently on a, a point eight. Uh, so 80 percent so work monday to thursday however i seem to be doing more on calls and out of hour shifts than some of my full training um, full-time uh, equivalent uh, colleagues i have been told that on average for a six month uh, uh, i work 35 hours per week and as such i still fall into the 80 percent category however there is a huge discrepancy in out of hours shifts 80% should mean that I work 80% of out of hours as well as 80% of the normal working shifts, shouldn't it? Yes, yeah, that's she's correct. So I think they've calculated her rota incorrectly. So she should go back. She should do 80% pro rata of all the different types of shifts. So short days, long days, weekend, long days, night shifts, that kind of thing. Assuming that she's 80% stand in a standalone post with that slot share. Thank you, Kum. And um, then there was a question about um, how does going 80% affect your pay? Is it true that you still need a specific reason uh, to go less than full time training? Might leave the pay one to Maddie, but uh, no, category three is a, a, a choice rather than a reason. Yeah, so the pay for um, working less than full time, I find um, uh, you actually, despite dropping your hours to 80%, you might not lose 20% of your pay because you end up paying um, less in tax and national insurance and student loan contributions. And in England, we've negotiated this less than full time allowance of £1,000 a year to help um, for the fact that you sometimes can end up paying more towards your um, GMC, MDU, uh, your indemnity. Um, but it's important to look into the discounts that you're entitled to. So the BMA offers um, a discount for less than full time doctors. Um, if you're below a certain income threshold, I think it's £50,000. The Royal College of Paediatrics will give you a discount on your training fees if you're 80% or below. So look into what discounts are available. Um, but the, the pay situation is not too bad, other than there is one um, uh, little idiosyncrasy with pension contributions. So as a less than full time doctor, you get a bit screwed over because your um, pension contribution bracket is based on your full time equivalent earnings, regardless of what less than full time percentage you work so that means the lower a percentage you work the more expensive comparatively your pension is at the end that's something that the BMA have been lobbying on for a long time um, and a public consultation is likely to open into pension contributions um, in, in the next few months we're hoping to resolve that for the start of the next financial year but for now unfortunately you do get pensioned um, uh, in a bracket as per your full-time working hours um, but 
yeah, it, it's a really good idea to ask your colleagues. Um, we don't often talk about pay much as, as doctors, um, but I think we should be more transparent because then we would spot more when um, errors are occurring and we're not getting paid correctly. Um, but I'm sure you'll have some colleagues locally that would be happy to, to show you a, a pay slip um, to uh, give you an idea of what you might get for a certain number of hours. Um, I, I saw a question about pay a bit further on about um, about visas. Um, now that the visa thresholds changed, I think it was last year or the year before. So it, previously it was really, really hard for people on a tier two visa to, to go LTFT because they, they would drop below what was it, I think at the time about £32,000 threshold um but it's been dropped i think it's about twenty one thousand now which means that uh, that that ltft training is suddenly a lot more accessible to people on the tier two visa who are working in health and social care so actually that that um uh, astrid 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 mommy's in a meeting could you just wait a minute i'll deal with it in a second okay yeah um so so that that's the information's all out there on the gov.uk website um but but yeah that's an answer to that question Thank you both. Actually, um, Anna, you have answered uh, one of the other questions about um, pensions. So pension was brought up. Um, what does it mean for less than four time trainees? Um, just to mention that, um, let me go back to the list. Um, so um, how does progression work at 80 percent less than full time training? So Claire has touched on this. Guidance is very uh, opaque and they are uh, varying um, sort of and opposing um, views what trainees do here so if um, any of the TPDs are happy to take this yeah um, it's not it's not opposing I mean I think people kind of think I, I put it this way people think that um that you you are just you know someone said to me oh but I didn't think it would be any different if I went 80 percent it's just one day less but that's 20 percent less than a full-time trainee so I think if you look at the analogy of a training journey as we talked about um if you're going on the same journey as someone else and you're going to get there at the same time but you're going at a different pace then there's got to be something different either about you or about your, your you know your journey your training environment so yes it's capability based time is the currency you spend to gain those capabilities to some of us you know we may need more time we may need less time and i think really it's just about um uh proving that you have got those capabilities, but that's a retrospective thing. You have no idea when you say, I'm going to train at 80%, that that 20%, which is a fifth less, is not going to matter. So it's either that we've got the timing wrong, and we may have, and that we don't need that period of time in the post, um, but it's the same for full-time trainees. It's still capability-based, and if you think that you're on track to gain those capabilities in less time than your indicative uh, CCT date, then that should be proven by your demonstration of those capabilities and at ARCP by fast tracking. And then we'll move that, bring that uh, CCT date back, you know, forwards, forwards, backwards, forwards. Um, but, you know, it's a retrospective thing. Um, and, and we don't, we, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be a contentious issue at all. It's the same for full-time trainees. Um, your indicative CCT date is only ever just based on time but your true CCT date is then based on how quickly you, you gain those cap rec um, recommended or required capabilities. So it shouldn't be a contentious issue. I would echo what Anne said, it's, it's not contentious, it's very much in keeping with the, say for a level three as it stands currently, is three years whole time indicative, and that really just is a, this is what most trainees need, this is how much most trainees need and whether you're full-time or less than full-time if you um, are able to show your capabilities in less time than three years whole time equivalent then that is accelerating training and that's what you do but um, you don't know that at the beginning of your journey. Um, there is one more related question thank you so much for the answers um, about um, progression um, so fast tracking is only applied to levels, not training year. However, some people um, have also been held back years for not doing a, a fast track form. They're particularly important for SC2 to uh, SC3 due to the pay change without changing levels. Uh, do you need to do the uh, fast track form for this? Um, 
I think level one is the is the only one is the only uh, level where you move from years because of the exams um, and the capabilities. And so it's not so much about the capabilities; it's really more about the exams. Uh, otherwise, really, it, it's 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 no different. Um, again, I think if you discuss with your TPD, um, particularly if you have, and we have trainees who have done the foundation, they've done an F. Why three year or done a fellow post before they started pediatrics uh, or done some other, you know, GP or whatever and have some actual experience to bring into the program um, and want to accelerate. And we have some trainees who, who actually, as they get then their pediatric number, have indicated already that they will want to use that experience to fast track um, or accelerate their training. The college is trying to ban the word fast track. They just haven't found the, a, a, a better uh, term. Um, so I think again, if we if we know, then we will we will um, change at that ARCP. I'm quite aware now of some trainees that have had pay issues because of that. But I think if you if you speak to the school to the LSP as, as soon as possible before the ARCP, we want the six months notice. I think that's quite important. But it, you know, if you've missed it for one reason or the other, still speak to your TPD and see what can be done. It's it's in it's in stone for the level three trainees because your fast tracking means you're completing training and that's vital. Um, so we do need that. The college says six months minimum a year, preferably. But all the other levels, we we um, we, we you know we want the six months. But if there's a reason why you couldn't give us that six months, then do discuss with the school um, as early as possible. Thank you so much again for the um, answers. Um, I'm just conscious that in about two minutes uh, the meeting will end. Um, there was one a particular question about a slot sharing and 80% uh, and how does that work? Shanti, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> So um, it, that is an interesting thing, uh, given that uh, we have an increasing number of trainees who are working 80 percent. Um, so the way it should work is that you um, do what you what you would, whether you're 60 percent or 80 percent, the in hours should be exactly the same. You work 80 percent of your in hours. It's the out of hours that tend to trip people up in terms of their expectation. So the out of hours, if you're in a slot share, will be um, the vast majority of the time a 50-50 split. Where um, departments have gaps in their rotors, they may well um, ask you to make up the rest of that percentage pro rata out of hours, uh, working flexibly across the other potential shifts. Um, alternatively, if your out of hours is 50%, then the extra hours that you should be working are likely to end up being daytime work. Make, you make it up within the day. Does that make sense? I don't know whether you had any queries. I know that um, we're just be becoming increasingly mindful about the number of trainees who are 80% and slot sharing. Um, because if you have um, too many in one department, they won't be able to accommodate you within their uh, rotors. And so that becomes a bit of an issue, particularly from a financial point of view. Um, and I think increasingly across the country, um, there is a move not to put uh, as many 80% um, less than full time trainees in slot shares. Um, but I think in hours is very straightforward, out of hours, negotiate, but you will need to do the hours you're contracted for. Thank you so much, Shanti. Um, you have answered quite a lot of other questions um, uh, related, uh, in relation to out of hours percentages and all that. Go on, Madhi. You're muted, Madhi. OK, so, so when, when the rost joint rostering guidance was agreed between uh, NHS employers and the BMA um, that talked about managing um, on-call splits in slot shares, mm -hmm. this was done at, at a time where there was very much 80%, there weren't very many 80% trainees, they certainly were not in slot shares, and the vast majority of people in slot shares were 60 or 50%. That situation has changed massively over the past couple of years with the introduction of 80% trainees. The good rostering guidance, that same document, says that your um, so that your 
working and your your in and out of hours percentages should should match your, your out of hours percentage should roughly match your in hours percentage um, and that your rotor pattern should be very similar to the one of, of full time trainees. Um, and I think what we really need here, because because there are some people where splitting 80, 50, 50 down the middle um, is going to really, really suit them. And I've known some trainees who absolutely love it. So, um, for example, people who have specialist interests that are mainly in hours, they get to go to more clinics, the department has more cover, people who have difficulties with childcare. So there are people who this really, really works for. But there are other people who um, it really doesn't work for out of. So the acutest, the people who want the out of hours experience, the people who um, need that money. Um, and, 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 and really, I think if we're going to have more and more trainees working 80%, what we need is a really flexible way of doing that, some intelligent rostering stuff. So, um, so instead of slot sharing two people, it's slot sharing two over three. So, so getting three people to go into two. And I think as these years go by with more and more people, I can see a lot of nodding there from people who are in the know about these things. What we're going to need is an awful lot more uh, clever rostering solutions about fitting people in without disadvantaging them, um, because there are some people that will be disadvantaged on being made to pick up random on calls from different slots and there are other people yeah. for who that will be the perfect thing for them. Um, so I think it's all about the communication and and um, and 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 sharing bright ideas with each other about how we make this work and how we make this sustainable for everybody. And I think I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's why this forum that's 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 something I think that that can really help um, because we're, we're we're getting this particularly across level two. There are lots of eighty percent slot sharing and in sub specialty training. So I think we really would value that. Um, networking and sharing ideas and, and how to to make sure that we're not disadvantaged. It's a it's a great way to train eighty percent, but we need to make sure that it's you know we don't disadvantage the trainees that decide to do so. Thank you so much. Um, very comprehensive um, answers as always. And um, just one very quick one to highlight, given the that the category three um, application uh, um, deadline is approaching. If a trainee decides to put in an application and then uh, withdraws or decides by the start of the rotation to withdraw it, is this easily done? It becomes very difficult once the rotations have been sent to the trust. So if you've applied and you change your mind, the recommendation is you do that before the 16 week deadline um, and certainly um, because the way that works in terms of your program management is that as program managing TPDs we are asked to lock down all placements at least um, 16 weeks but there's a bit of a fudge so um, but by 12 weeks we're asked to lock down all of the placements so we will have had to have reviewed all of our trainees pop them in the most appropriate posts um, for their training needs and um, submitted it for their HEE so that HEE can let trusts know for the 12 week deadline so they can start their eight week rotors and their six week rotors. Um, once we've placed you in a slot share, if you then change your mind and say, actually, I want to go full time, as um, Anne said before, there may not be a full time slot available, in which case you're going to have to stay in that slot share for those six months. And then we can try and see what's uh, available from the sort of the next rotational date. Um, but the, the, if you're going to change your mind, do so as soon as possible um, and then be have a bit of flexibility that uh, that you might not be able to from the point that you were going to go for less than full time, it might be another six months before we can accommodate that change. Thank you, Shanti. I'm sorry, I'm just going to um, try to go through uh, chats and the uh, questions as well. Um, there is a question just in the chat. Are there any additional considerations for those applying for grit and less than full time training at the same time? Uh, it should. It makes no difference. It really does not. But 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 it means obviously you're you're going to be placed um, for longer um, than than a full time trainee. But it other it really makes no difference. I, in a way, I kind of think you get a little bit. I don't know more choice. Um, 
in in that instance there I say it. I'm not officially this has been recorded uh but I, but I think that actually you you do but it makes no except to say actually but this is not just less than full-time trainees if you're a match rotating trainee um then we actually it's the only time we'll extend your CCT for the purposes of grid so that you're not disadvantaged and a lot of our less than full-time trainees have their program finishing in March because they're out of sync so not, not just less than full-time trainees, trainees who've come back from mat leave or have taken a six-month OOP, and so they're not doing a whole year. Um, but that's the only time we'll, the, we will extend your training by six months so that you're not disadvantaged and have a shorter period of um, time for, to be eligible for um, subspecialty training applications. So that's quite an important thing to remember. We, you just need to put it on the eligibility form and we will extend your CCT date. Um, two more questions from me, and then let, uh, let me see whether there is anything else uh, coming back. So, important one about uh, rotations. Uh, does um, going less than full-time uh, training affect your rotation choices um, and what you are given in terms of rotations? As uh, the training for, say, level two is normally, or level one and level two is set, uh, so once you are given your rotation, you know, how does it work for the rest of the, or the extension of your uh, training level, if that makes sense? Um, I mean, if you, what, sorry, I wasn't quite clear about the question. I mean, it, um, if you're less than full time, then you will be placed, obviously, for longer, um, assuming, because we just have to do the time based calculation and then obviously if you then want to uh, do whatever level in a shorter time then and you can show that you've achieved your competencies and your ES is supportive then you apply to fast track that level um, and obviously as much as possible we will try and place um, you know um, less than full-time trainees in the, the hospitals of choice and keep keep them within a geographical area um, so it, it shouldn't disadvantage but again it, it would very much depend on what jobs there are um, so occasionally you know there'll be some some posts or some hospitals where actually the posts are already taken a few years you know for a few you know a couple of years down the line already filled um, and so we physically can't allocate you and therefore might have to move you around to accommodate that. So I'm not sure I entirely answered the question. Yeah, uh, one, one, more, one more question for me, because I have never trained um, less than full time in my level one training. So do you give the level one trainees, um, if they are training, say, 60 percent, do you give them, um, you know, the whole sort of three year full time equivalent um, uh, training rotations at the, from the very, very start? Um, I think I think that is what um, definitely Ruth tries to do. But again, or sometimes if it yeah. becomes a very, very long program, um, then she might just say, well, I'm going to do like the first couple of years or something like that, because actually she knows that by the time it comes to you know, the second or third year, invariably things will have changed um, and um, then everything ends up getting moved around. Um, sorry, I can't. I can't answer for her 100. percent Yeah. Well, and sometimes, sometimes even sometimes they're just not enough. They're not. You know, the program doesn't look right. You want to give all. You know, three years full time equivalent, which I think will be four and a half years. I think if you're 60 percent, for instance, um, but actually you would have to move you around because there isn't space, and they might kind of just give you, you know, the first two years, knowing that people will drop out or you know go on mat leave or leave the program, et cetera, and you'll be able to get a better um, uh, a better training program. And that's the same for full-time trainees. It's no different. It's just that we have more, um, a longer period of time to place place you. But we try to place trainees for all levels. But we shape a training coming next year might be a little bit different. But we generally try and give you um, your placements for the levels and try and keep it within as few trusts as possible so that you've got, you know, um, longitudinal ESs and that kind of thing. Yeah, so definitely for level two, when I do my placements, if I can, I'll give the whole programme. If I can't, and particularly if by the time I'm doing the placements, 
you know, that that I'm look, really looking at fourth, fifth, sixth choices for a trainee, I might place them just for six months in the hope that I can then move them to a much higher choice subsequently, um, rather than actually putting them in a trust that they don't want to work in for two years. Thank you both. Um, one more question. This is really, really interesting. And I think uh, probably like the whole self string uh, comes into here. So if you were a 50% trainee with category one and two, is there flexibility to bunch shifts together, uh, say work 80% for four months and then have two months off? Uh, for example, is this um, something that uh, trainees do or would do or could do? I think that was the question asked before as well. I think we basically said that's very much de um, dependent on the department and your rota, and you would have to negotiate that locally um, with your department and your colleagues, probably. Um, thank you. One more um, in the chat. Um, uh, thank you, Maddie. Yep, yeah, no, absolutely. Please do leave. Um, so, one more, um, sorry, hang on, I lost it. Uh, does local trust uh, allocations of 50% uh, of on-call hours, um, if the less than full-time uh, training percentage is higher, have an overall impact on the duration of the training? No. The out of hours does not impact. Okay. Um, I think uh, that's pretty much uh, the rest of uh, them have been covered uh, with um, sort of annual leave and days. Uh, I think we have had quite a comprehensive um, um, summary of everything. So if there are no more questions, uh, that's all uh, from the pre-collected ones that haven't probably been answered directly or were more specific. I think that's all the questions answered. Thank you ever so much to everyone that came along to answer the questions and do talks. Thank you for everyone attending. It's been recorded, so it'll be you can send people off to the YouTube and they can watch it. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for staying on, especially. Thank you so much.